webinars. Um, we got the honor to introduce our, our speaker today. I want to remind people we have two, two talks um, coming up uh, on next week with Dr. Phil Thompson and on December 5th with Tom Schoenwitner. Um, give talks on um, in this in this series. Um, so please put those on your calendar. Um, the reason why I was asked to introduce Ethan was largely because he was one of my students uh, a number of years ago. Uh, I think he graduated in 2014, then uh, worked with me for one more year to help me get some uh, research in the ground. I got several pictures of him carrying a drip torch to the stand with a maniacal flapping all the time. Um, uh, trying to burn off some some oak, re uh, oak regeneration down in southern Indiana. Um, uh, so given the Halloween day, I mean, you can kind of picture Ethan now with that maniacal sounding laugh. Um, <laughs> and anyway, um, so after uh, he graduated in my lab, he had done a lot of work working on uh, American chestnut. Uh, we were looking at the some of the earliest work on looking at the fire ecology of the regeneration side of that piece. We knew the, the overstory, the mature trees were had ad adaptations to fire, but we were not quite sure on how regeneration played a role in that. Uh, so uh, his work was some of the earliest in that area. Um, after graduating from here, he proceeded to go back to University of New Hampshire where he had gotten his undergraduate and worked in the Mark Ducey lab. Um, and he didn't, he, and he bounced, you bounced around a little bit. You had like an extension forester um, gig for a while and then lab manager and he did teaching at the University of New Hampshire. So he juggled a lot of things um, and was really active in the Northeast, to, uh, in the uh, forestry community in the Northeast United States. Uh, I think that notice, um, he got the notice of the Nature Conservancy and then 2020 was hired by the Nature Conservancy to lead uh, the program that he's going to talk about today in terms of nature, um, nature-based silviculture and, and carbon sequestration. Um, and this is a worldwide program. So he's been, Donna, was it right? Uh, uh, Gabon. Gabon. So yeah. Gabon. So he's been uh, to several of the continents talking about this concept with TMC op operatives. And um, can I call them operatives? I like that term. Okay. <laughs> um, in uh, uh, around the world. Um, so anyway, I want to don't want to take any more of his time, so he can tell you all this knowledge that he's accumulated over the last ten years. Um, Ethan, thanks, Mike. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, Ethan Belair, um, and I'm going to talk about that that global program that Mike mentions, the Climate Smart Forestry Program at the Nature Conservancy. Um, when I say climate smart forestry, it's sort of everything to do with working forests that includes a carbon and climate lens, right? So we'll get into a bit more of the details there, but it's it's forestry with a climate component, right? Um, that, 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 thank you. All right, so just a, a brief context of, of what I'm going over. So I wanna introduce sort of who I am um, so that you have some context for, for what I'm talking about. I wanna introduce you to the idea of natural or the topic of natural climate solutions. Show of hands, who knows what a natural climate solution is? Is that a term folks are familiar with? Few few people, but not, not everybody. So we're going to go through sort of basics of, of NCS, why they're important, how much they matter, um, and how climate smart forestry fits into that lens. And then I really want to spend the bulk of my time talking about the actual projects that we work on. What does my team do? Where do we work? What are we trying to do? What's the science component? Uh, and then... Uh, being a TMC person, I have to do some shameless self-promotion and tell you about our website. So um, to tell you where all our research stuff lives. All right, so starting with this, this sort of personal introduction, um, I think at a very basic level um, and going, going back to my time at Purdue, going back before then, I care about trees and I care about people. Um, and I think that it's sometimes under-recognized the amount of places that people benefit from trees and forests. And um, there's all sorts of different benefits that we derive from forests, and I don't think that we should be sheepish about using forests, whether that's being, you know, used for, and, you know, this is veneer, but a wood product, or if this is being used to combat climate change, right? We can feel good about manipulating forests to get more of the things that people desire and use from them. 
Um, I'll replicate Mike's little uh, uh, CV in a nutshell. Um, I went from Purdue to the University of New Hampshire, and I went through it. It was a research scientist, lab manager type position, way out in the field, right? Doing doing stuff on the ground. Transitioned into an extension forestry position, where I spent most of my time working with individual landowners and helping them understand what the options for management on their woodlot was. Spent a couple of years teaching in the, the forestry program at UNH, all the nuts and bolts forestry courses like silviculture and GIS and uh, logging practice. And then about four years ago, four and a half years ago, I got this job with Nature Conservancy and um, darn it, but they send me everywhere. And uh, I've gotten to go to a lot of cool places. We're tied in, we have field teams mm -hmm. in 76 countries now and all 50 US states. And so, you know, when I, I work in, um, you know, the top right picture, that's the Republic of Congo. And uh, you know, we've got people on the ground that we can collaborate with. They help set up some of the logistics so that we can come in and do the sort of targeted science that that program needs uh, in order to do the conservation that they're working on. Okay, so I'm going to jump into natural climate solutions. This is, I think of this, this is, this is a hot topic across environmental sciences right now. How do we solve climate change and can we use nature to that end? Um, so pretty hot topic. It's also pretty broad. We could spend the next semester talking about natural climate solutions and not get to the bottom of it. Uh, I'm going to spend five minutes. So, um, <laughs> that is a certain level of depth, right? Um, okay. So, so again, basic definitions, natural climate solutions are ways that you can protect, better manage, or restore natural and human managed ecosystems to have a positive climate impact. Right? So that can mean a lot of different things in different places. It might mean protecting an at-risk peat-based soil wetland, where really all you want to do is just, just don't degrade it. Right? In other places, most of my work is about we're already managing a forest in this place. Can we manage it better? Can we start thinking more explicitly about the climate outcomes, include those in our optimization, and improve the outcomes at a stand scale and eventually at a landscape scale. Everything to do with natural climate solutions is, is basically an outgrowth of this, you know, the basic carbon cycle that you all saw in your, your sixth grade science textbooks, right? Trees, sequ plants sequester carbon from the atmosphere through photosynthesis. It's re-emitted when they die, when they burn through any number of different actions. And so what natural climate solutions boil down to is trying to use this carbon cycle to our advantage. Can we think ahead and plan such that we are growing more trees than we are, you know, seeing emitted through various human and natural disturbances? And the reason this is important, you know, I'm sure you've all seen some version of this graph as well, which is, you know, sort of here's the trajectory that we're on in terms of business as usual emissions. And if we want to, you know, some, some folks are using the two degrees Celsius, some are using 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, you know, the, the bar, the specific bar doesn't matter. If we want to limit the impact of climate change, we need to figure out that wedge, right? The, the wedge between business as usual emissions and the path that we, we need to be on. And the biggest chunk of that is, I think we'd, we'd all agree is fairly obvious, reducing fossil fuel use and, and transitioning to renewable sources of energy, right? But that's difficult. It's costly. There's industries for which that is antithetical to the way that they work. How do you make a less carbon intensive airplane? That's really hard, right? While we figure that out, we think that natural climate solutions, this green bar, are a really critical piece because they can provide a large percentage of the mitigation that we need in the short term in, in an effect that buys us time to figure out how to decarbonize the rest of our you know, species, really. Um, and so you know, we, we have this number, you know, 11 gigatons annually, which I'll put in context in a moment, um, is what we think that NCS can provide. And that's NCS writ large. So the forest-based stuff that I'm going to talk about, but also protecting peatlands, also restoring grasslands, putting biochar and ag soils, all sorts of different activities. And so where does climate smart forestry fit into that? Um, you know, I, I think climate smart forestry is the best natural climate solution, being which is the one that I work on. Um, I think it's also the most varied, 
right? There are a lot of different activities, practices, whatever you want to call them, the things that you do on the ground. It's a lot of different, widely varying practices that fit under climate smart forestry. And I've listed out a, a few of them here. Extended rotations. You were going to grow that forest to 100 years and then harvest it, grow it to 120 years instead. Um, logging reserves. We were going to harvest this 100 acres. Now we're going to set 20 acres aside and we're going to harvest the remaining 80. Um, you know, th those ones are fairly obvious. There's there's things that are perhaps less obvious. Avoided logging damage is something I'm going to talk a lot about. Can we harvest the same number of trees but create fewer emissions, mm -hmm. right, to make our, our wood sort of more carbon efficient? There's lots of different things that can slot under climate smart forestry, but basically what it boils down to is natural climate solutions in a working forest context. And so natural climate solutions are about using nature to improve carbon and climate outcomes. If you're doing that in a working forest where you're producing some sort of forest product or benefit for the, the communities around it, you're doing climate smart forestry. All right, so, so how that works at the Nature Conservancy, we try our best to take a holistic perspective, zoom out and say, where are, where are there pieces of information that we know? Where are the gaps where we don't know certain pieces of information? And which of those gaps can be most impactful in terms of improving climate and conservation outcomes? All right, so doing a gap analysis and, and identifying where are the high leverage pieces of science that we can do that would spur additional implementation. Uh, we do that with anybody who wants to work with us. You know, we work with governments and universities and other nonprofits, other conservation organizations. We also work with some folks that that may be more surprising, like uh, integrated timber companies in the U.S. We work with, uh, if you guys know, show of hands, you guys know what a, a concession is in the tropical part of the world? Okay, so a concession is a large piece of land that a government retains ownership of, but grants to someone, a company, to manage the resources on that. So, uh, Kanan, I might, as the government of the Republic of Congo, grant you 100,000 hectares, and you can manage the timber on that as long as you pay me taxes, right? So we work with those concessionaires. We work with the people who run those concessions, which sometimes catches us some flack. But from my perspective, if they're the ones impacting the forest and we're trying to minimize impacts on the forest, kind of ought to be working with them. So, so we work with a lot of different folks to try and get our science done. And this way overly complicated circle thing over here, we're not committed to the fact that this has to always be through a climate lens. There's certain places where it makes sense to just grow two by fours because people need two by fours. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't always need to be with carbon and climate as your first goal, but you should consider those outcomes while you're producing two by fours is sort of our argument. So climate smart forestry, if you think about the, the spectrum of, of natural climate solutions options, I said this 11 gigatons number before. So that's what we think is available annually from all of these different practices, right? From protecting peatlands to restoring grasslands. Um, if you look at the portion that falls into climate smart forestry, it's uh, you know, a little more than 10%, about one and a half gigatons per year is what we think is biologically possible. If we did all the things in all the places, we'd get about one and a half gigatons a year. It's probably not a likely outcome. Things cost money. Uh, we got to do the cheaper things before we do the more expensive things. We got to do the, the low friction changes as opposed to the high friction changes. Um, if we look through that lens, we think the reasonable amount that we could get is about half of the <clears throat> biological potential. So it's about you know 0.8 gigatons per year, 0.9 gigatons per year. Um, Anybody know what a gigaton is? I, sh I sure don't know what a gigaton is. It's, you know, that 0.9 gigatons is equivalent to 190 million cars off the road annually. Like that's th that's something I can wrap my head around, right? And, and that's a pretty big change. So we think that this has the opportunity to be fairly impactful uh, at a global scale in terms of our climate outcomes. All right, I'm going to transition into what I think is the, the fun part, the, the real uh, nuts and bolts science that we get to do in the field. Um, and, and actually, let me go back. So I'm going to do four case studies. One of them is going to be a bit bigger, pull out some of the details, and the other, the, the remaining three, I'll touch on somewhat more briefly. But this first one, reduced impact logging, this is a big part of what our program uh, does 
under climate smart forestry because it's something that we've been working on the longest. It precedes my time at the Nature Conservancy. We've been working on this for about 15 years. Um, and the basic idea is smarter logging saves trees, right? You can you can cut trees down, you can harvest trees in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. And if you do that carefully with planning, you put your skid roads in certain places, you put your haul, hauling infrastructure in terms of roads and log yards in certain places, um, you directionally fell the trees, you can have lower impacts and still harvest timber. You can still get the product that people are going in there for in the first place, but you can do it with better environmental outcomes. And so that's the reduced impact logging portion. Of this. There's also some forest tech portions here where our desire to do reduced impact logging better has driven us to develop some uh, data and geospatial tools that have broader applications. So I'm gonna kind of pair those two things to talk about here. All right, so, so reduced impact logging, I think is most easily uh, described with pictures, right? Again, you can you can cut trees in a lot of different ways. You can cut trees with a lot of different equipment, right? On the left is a typical access point to an individual tree, usually harvested with bulldozers or other crawling type tractors. That, that photo is in Indonesia, all right? And so that that is the entry point there. You know, I don't think we can actually see the stump, but some, somewhere back here, there's a stump. That amount of damage is done for a single tree, only a portion of which is actually pulled out of the woods and commercialized, right? So there's soil disturbance, there's extra trees that are being killed or, or negatively impacted. So a lot of damage associated with that. On the right-hand side, this is a long line winch system, same property, same owners, same logging crew, different equipment. And so this is, you know, you see the, the log here, 200 meters further out in the forest, there's a large winch that they cable to a tree, so it's stable, and that's pulling the log out. You don't need that 200 meters to be a road or a path that you can drive with a, with a bulldozer. You can pull it out with a steel cable. And in doing so, you dramatically reduce the impact that you're having on the residual forest. You're leaving more trees alive and in a healthy condition to store and continue to sequester carbon. There are other sort of aspects to this, right? On the, on the left-hand side, there's a hollow tree. Most of the times in, in, uh, in the tropical world, in the developing world, when you get a, a hollow stemmed tree, the milling uh, uh, equipment isn't able to saw that. And so that tree on the left gets felled and it gets left in the woods. We don't get any boards. We don't get any paper products. We don't get any human benefit from that. All we get is the negative environmental impact, right? And that's not a small percentage of trees that that happens to. In some places, that's 40% of the trees they cut down. It's a big number. If you only cut the solid cord trees, you avoid that impact. Well, it's pretty easy. This is nuts and bolts stuff. The person felling that tree with a chainsaw, instead of just going straight into your wedge cut and felling the tree, bore cut into the tree, the chainsaw's sound and feel is going to change very dramatically if it's hollow. So you can tell before you cut the tree down if it's hollow. If it's hollow, don't cut it, right? There's there's very little, you know, uh, technical difficulty there. It's just a matter of convincing people that that's a good approach and showing them the benefits that it can have, right? So, so to, to zoom out a little bit, the, the context for this, um, you know, 25% of the, the forests in, in the tropical part of the world are selectively logged or are available, designated for selective logging through things like concessions. And what we see typically, if we think around the globe in that, is that, you know, 2% of those trees are harvested, but 10% are damaged. So for every one unit, whether it's a tree or a cubic meter or whatever you want to think of it in, Every one unit that we cut and commercialize, it ends up in a table, it ends up in a paper product, whatever. There's five additional units that we damage and would leave on the ground, right? That is just, it's wasteful. And it's pretty easy to see that we're being wasteful there. And we can't bring that down to zero, but we can bring it a lot lower than five to one. Okay, so so products that my team has, has built for this. So. Um, you can see on the, the very top left is a, a paper that my boss led around um, 
uh, reduced impact logging and its potential for uh, climate change mitigation? What is the overall opportunity if we improved logging practice globally, right? And so we tried to put a, put a number on that and we ended up finding about 50% of that damage can be reduced, right? So we could reduce logging emissions by half. Then we're, we're agnostic as to exactly the mechanism that this work gets done by, but we recognize the value of carbon markets to incentivize that work. And so we've built several carbon accounting tools um, like uh, the, the one here says verified carbon standard. This is uh, the overarching methodology that gives you, you know, numbers and equations by which you can calculate. We switched from a conventional logging system to a reduced impact logging system. And it helps you measure the changes that that creates in your emissions profile, right? And companies that do that can be compensated for that, right? They can they can sell those carbon credits that the methodology produces on the voluntary market. And so there's a strong incentive for them to do that better management. Um, and the, the lowest one, which you probably can't read at all, um, we're, we're working on at the moment in the Republic of Congo because these require geographically specific modules. You have to go into the Congo and understand how logging works in Congo before you can set up that carbon accounting tool. You can't compare Congo to Indonesia because they're different systems. Um, in the course of doing all of these, what we've recognized is that probably the biggest chunk, not in every location, every forest, but in most of them, the biggest chunk of the, the mitigation that we can create is from changing the way that we do roads and hauling infrastructure, right? Left-hand side, that's a, a haul road in Indonesia. They clear much wider than they need for the actual road surface because uh, solar radiation dries out the soil and allows equipment in there. Um, on the right-hand side, this is different, different location. This is in Suriname, but um, you know, different approach where you're using much smaller equipment, much lower uh, footprint, and you're able to do it with a small haul road. Huge differences in terms of the carbon outcomes of those different things. So can we can we figure out how to do this style of forestry in that place and replace those practices? That's that's essentially part of what we're trying to figure out how to do. And towards that, we have to know where those haul roads are, how fast they're going in, where they're being used to create access for timber, extraction versus other activities like agriculture or hunting. Um, and we wanna be able to do that at scale across broad geographies. So uh, one of the, the folks on my team, Kurt Fessenmeyer is working on this uh, road mapping project using deep learning and AI algorithms uh, with multi-sensor satellite data, right? Can we essentially, I'm not a huge geospatial guy, the way I understand it, it's a layer stack and we can, can look over time with different archived versions of those data layers and watch these roads come into being. So you can see, you know, sort of just optical imagery in, in these two, like you can see the roads from space, but they fill in because the trees grow over the roads, right? But you can, you know, create this reference data and, and try to get something like this where it's, it's a false color image, it's a, it's a um, derivation of that, but those signals are something that we can pin down, whereas an optical signal is very quickly obscured, especially in the tropics where, where plants grow really, really fast. And so what we've been able to build this into is a, a system. You'll see these different colors of red. These are different vintages of road. Like when was the road built? And so we have the ability now, we do quarterly time steps and produce maps of logging roads because you can see, you know, okay, this section was logged in 2019, or the roads were installed in 2019, might have been logged in 2020, whereas these roads were built primarily in 2021 and 2022, maybe haven't even been logged yet. Maybe they built the roads and, and it's you know TBD on the logging. Um, but that allows us to think about the, the flow of resources in and out of these concessions and where the focal points want to be from a conservation perspective. Right? Where is there active logging that we might be able to uh, improve the outcomes from versus where are there, you know, is there, is there a lack of management or, or a cessation of management in the recent, uh, uh, recent history? So this becomes uh, uh, pretty helpful, uh, not just from a um, reduced impact logging perspective, but from other data perspectives as well. So these are, uh, these are blocks within a concession and concessions are most often 
um, pretty tightly regulated. And they say, you can cut so many trees in a given year. And they'll carve it into blocks like this that have you know, timestamps on them. So that top left block is eligible for logging 2021 to 2023. If they harvest it in 2024, that's illegal logging, right? And they get they get slapped by the, the government for that. So um, we're using this now, the, the, sort of the, the cutting edge on this is we're trying to use this to predict harvest volumes from these sites, right? And we're finding that, you know, because we can we can look at the age of this road and the amount of road in that block, that correlates very tightly with the amount of trees, the amount of cubic meters of wood they've harvested from those areas. That seems sort of, well, you built this whole thing just to be able to get volume data. No, but that's a positive outflow from this. And volume data for a lot of these parts of the world, you know, they're coming from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. They're really not very accurate. Oftentimes they're made up at a desk somewhere between the UN agent and somebody who sort of knows the context of that, that country and that economy. Um, this gives us the ability to really pinpoint and target where is logging heaviest versus where is logging you know, pretty sparse, right? Because we may have different concerns of the different environmental impacts that that has. If you have very heavy logging, there's gonna be more opportunity for invasive plant uh, incursions. There's going to be more open ground, but a lot of times these, these harvested sands get shifted into agricultural use. Like there's, there's certain things that are in, uh, a worry there, versus very sparse roads with light logging, we think more about poaching and hunting because those are extremely rural areas, but that have a road into the forest that provides access. So there's different conservation uh, worries in different scenarios. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Switch gears a little bit and talk about three other projects in slightly less detail. Um, so liana cutting. Um, these are, lianas is the botanical term, but really it's, it's, it's a vine, right? It's a woody vine. And you can see different examples here of uh, these vines inhabiting trees. It's what they do, right? They've been doing it for millennia. They're really good at it. But part of the downside of having all those vines in the trees is that they slow the growth of the, the tree that they're the host, the host tree, right? Um, and doesn't hurt the tree in a lot of situations. The tree persists but it grows more slowly. It might lose branches. It might not reach its full potential, which, you know, the tree as an organism is still alive, but us as people thinking of this through a carbon lens can understand that we're not maximizing the, the tree's potential to sequester carbon from the atmosphere. And so this is an instance where, you know, there are some acute environmental concerns here, trees that die from liana infestation, but there's way more trees that, are not optimizing their output from a human perspective, that removing the lianas helps to, to bring us closer to that optimum. And so this is a, a pretty low cost solution with uh, flexible and multi-resource benefits, right? You, you remove the lianas from a tree, the tree predictably grows faster. That has a carbon sequestration benefit, but it also has a timber benefit. Your tree grows faster, you're going to get board feet quicker, right? And so there's an inherent economic incentive for those concessionaires. And then if we're able to layer atop carbon income, there's a secondary uh, economic incentive there. Um, one thing to point out is that the liana density in some of those, tw that 25% of managed tropical forests have a higher than normal density of lianas. Because in the past, we've gone in, we've opened up the canopy, we've created more sunlight hitting the ground, which creates more lianas, right? Um, so to some degree, we're sort of bringing that back into, you know, a normal balance if we're cutting those lianas. Um, so, and, and lastly, this is a persistent benefit. This lasts for up to 30 years. You, know, you can think we cut the liana off that tree. We don't, we don't pull the vines down, we just cut it at the base, right? But it takes about 30 years for new lianas at the ground level to start from, from seed or the cut rootstock and wind its way back up the tree and cover the tree to the point of being impactful on that tree's growth. So a simple action of cutting the liana gets us 30 years of benefit. And when I say this is a low cost strategy, in a lot of these places where we're managing timber anyways, these companies send folks out in the woods to measure the trees, 
find out where those commercial individuals are, plan skid roads, all these sorts of things. And they're already carrying a machete because it's dense jungle and you've got to get through it, right? Having them cut lianas while they are visiting these trees is a very low additional cost. And so we, we end up finding that for about a dollar per ton of carbon uh, uh, mitigation impact uh, from, from liana cutting, which is far below the cost that it, uh, comes from other sources. You, know, you can think about how, how much does it cost to grow a tree in a nursery, pull that up with a tractor, ship it someplace else, have somebody plant it, and then wait 40 years for that tree to grow. It's a lot of time and money relative to, hey, you're already there. Why don't you cut these vines? Um, some of the work that we're doing on this, um, it started uh, most uh, the last five years or so, it started with some field trial impacts. How do how does how do different species of different size in different places respond to liana cutting? Is there a level of liana infestation from which those trees will not recover, and we should not cut those? Um, you know, sort of how does this work on the ground? And trying to figure out how to make a scientific idea operational in a forestry context. Uh, we had a paper last year led by uh, my colleague Jack Poots um, quantifying that opportunity at a global scale, trying to you know, take some general assumptions about 25% of the, the forests in the tropical tier are managed. Here's the individual tree impact, you know, but but put a, a estimate on what's the potential of this at a global scale? How much should, you know, climate investors be paying attention to something like liana cutting? Uh, right now, I'm working as part of a group with uh, Conservation International and a startup called Funga, uh, trying to build the carbon accounting methodology that will allow for economic incentives around liana cutting. Uh, so this is going to use a randomized control trial setup. Um, and so it's, you know, you don't necessarily get into natural resources because you want to sit behind a desk, but this is a lot of nerdy stats and computer work trying to create the basis from which we can quantify the impacts we're having in the forest. Uh, and then another colleague of mine is, is layering on top of our field trials, some biodiversity studies. So using uh, ground and arboreal camera traps and then uh, bioacoustic sampling to understand how does biodiversity change when you remove lianas from certain trees? Um, you know, those lianas, they're fruiting species very often. They're, uh, they enhance mobility of, of uh, organisms that live through the canopy, they have a benefit. And so we want to make sure you know, nature conservancy's two big uh, goals are climate and biodiversity amelioration. So we want to make sure if we're creating a climate benefit that we're not simultaneously creating a biodiversity, a negative biodiversity impact. This is my favorite, the Family Forest Carbon Program. Um, this is the project I got hired to work on at the Nature Conservancy. So. Um, this is a, a joint effort. You see the, the folks working on it in the bottom um, to try and engage small, non-industrial private landowners in carbon finance. Um, and especially the Eastern US, 80% of the, the land is owned by private individuals and families. Those people manage their forests for good or for ill. Let's make it for good, right? And so trying to incentivize them through the addition of carbon finance, which typically small landowners cannot access. Not that they're not allowed to, but that the scale isn't there. If you have 50 acres, you can't afford to do the paperwork or hire somebody to do the paperwork to do a carbon project. You probably don't have the analytical expertise in your own household, right? So can we provide that expertise, group together landowners and say, hey, you know, your 50 acres may not matter from a climate perspective, but we for your 50 acres with a thousand other people's 50 acres, it really matters. Uh, so the big part of this, this was um, this is what I got hired to do. So we built a uh, dynamic carbon accounting baseline. When I say dynamic, that's a really important term in the carbon accounting world right now. It means we're using real data collected over time to track what happens on those carbon projects. Um, this is, let's see if I put in the, okay. Um, that's, that's a critically important thing because a lot of the carbon accounting methodologies that have resulted in carbon credits thus far are based on models and projections. Some of you have likely heard or, or read in, in newspapers the, um, the negative press around uh, the voluntary carbon market. 
we're not producing the climate benefit that some of us are claiming on paper. Dynamic baselines help with that because you're not projecting the impact you will have. You're waiting until that's happened and you're looking backwards and saying, what impact did I have? Much more uh, uh, accurate way to go about that. The core part of how this uh, methodology works, um, this yellow property here, imagine that's a property that a landowner is doing something that we think is gonna increase carbon sequestration. They're limiting their harvest, they're removing lianas, they're using reduced impact logging, something that's gonna create that mitigation. And the, the little green trees on there represent the physical plots that we're measuring on those properties. Um, so, and we take that on the landowners, not responsible. We measure sort of what's going on as they do that management. Then all of these outlying trees, those represent uh, forest inventory and analysis uh, plot locations. That's a, a federal program uh, that has uh, data across the, the contiguous US and that serves as our comparison. So what we do is we find the 10 FIA points that are most similar, and I'll get to similar in just a second, the most similar to this yellow area, right? And those 10 most similar get blended together in something that approaches a model averaging approach. We take those 10 plots and you create a, we call it a pseudo plot. And that pseudo plot is what we compare to our field measured plots on the property, right? So we're saying essentially, we know we're doing climate smart forestry on this yellow area. And we know that more than likely these FIA points from other properties around are doing standard average forestry, whatever that means in this area. And so we have a comparison of standard average forestry to climate smart forestry, and that creates the, the sort of delta that we're looking for. Now, when I say similarity, that becomes sort of a tricky thing. The more similar that those FIA points are to your project property, the better and more robust your comparison is going to be. And so we use a, a suite. This isn't even up to date because we've got 16 now. Um, different variables that we're pulling in there to help us ensure the controls and the treatments are similar. So they've got similar types of trees, similar amounts of trees, similar age on a similar slope at a similar elevation, like all these things that influence the likelihood of harvest, the amount of carbon that accrues, how fast that carbon accrues. And so we have a very good apples to apples comparison for using this approach. Um, there's some other aspects here that I, I just wanted to briefly highlight about the work with, with FFCP. Um, you know, it's designing silvicultural practices that store more carbon, but also have the silvicultural uh, benefits that we're looking for. You know, I've had some conversations recently with, with Mike Saunders, Lenny Farley, around how we can design treatments that are good for carbon and also good for water, wood, wildlife, all the traditional things we value from forests. Um, there's also this, this whole um, stress, tr stress testing of practices and exploratory analyses. There's there's basically, there's no cookbook for how do you figure out what the carbon mitigation benefit of a certain practice is. You sort of have to wade into this unknown pool of like various pieces of data and just figure it out, right? And so I, I pulled one from a recent uh, presentation that we put together. Not that this is, this is not rocket science, but this is the sorts of things that we end up doing in the carbon program is, <clears throat> okay, we need a diagnostic test to determine what style of silviculture is currently being practiced from FIA plots so that we can model that in FBS and similar software, right? We can't go and visit every one of those and look at it in the field. We can't ask all those landowners. We need a quick data-driven test that tells us this or that, right? And so, you know, looking at the, the ratio between uh, QMDs, quadratic mean diameters, the average size of the trees in that stand. And looking at the difference between the average size of trees that were harvested versus what existed before harvest, right? That lets us look at were the trees that got cut larger than average in the stand, smaller than average, or pretty much along the average. That determines, and we have basically a thin from below, thin throughout the diameter distribution, or thin from above. Different silvicultural treatments that we're you know, we're determining what landowners have done with 
diagnostic tests based on data. Is it a perfect system? No, it's not. Does it work really fast for tens of thousands of plots? Yeah, it does. Um, and so a lot of what we end up doing is that sort of exploratory figure it out science. Um, yeah. All right, this is my, I think my last project to talk about. Um, forest carbon leakage. This is, this is an extremely arcane topic, but it's pretty important when you wade into a voluntary carbon markets perspective. Uh, what leakage is, is basically, you know, this, this whole schematic here, this green boundary, that's, that's where our carbon project is happening. Reduced impact logging, liana cutting, you know, you name it. And we have to set that boundary and say what's inside the project and what's outside the project, because we need to be able to account for the carbon, right? But then there's something that happens through an economic lens, which is what you do on the project area influences your neighbor. Right? And it's not just because your neighbor sees what's going on. It's because there's a market-driven signal that if I chose not to harvest some trees, trees are now marginally more valuable because I'm choosing not to harvest mine. Right, And so that makes other people's trees more valuable, and it might change the decisions that they make in a management context. It might change them in multiple different directions. Right, So we've got these sort of you know different uh, uh, examples here. The fact that I choose not to cut my trees may increase the, the value of trees marginally and someone else chooses to cut trees they wouldn't have cut until five years from now, right? It's a negative environmental impact from leakage. However, the fact that I'm doing a carbon program, I'm getting value from keeping my trees rather than harvesting them, also sends an economic signal that other people may go, you know, he's getting carbon money for those trees. I bet you I could get carbon money for my trees. Maybe I'm going to increase the uh, environmental nature of my management to try and spur additional growth in my forest. Maybe I'm going to see that he's not cutting his trees. And so there's a, an opportunity. If I had some trees, I could sell them. I'm going to go plant trees to create that opportunity. So there's both negative and positive aspects to leakage, but it's an inherently economic phenomenon. It's the fact that what I do with my property influences a market and that market influences what you do with your property, all right? Um, and yeah, positive and negative effects and the boundary there really matters. You can imagine if we if we drew this green boundary around these two folks over here, it's not leakage, it's part of the project. So, so having the right frame of reference is really important there. Um, the unfortunate part about this is it, it's pretty impactful. Um, it can be, you know, uh, uh, leakage can, can sort of account for 10 to 90 percent of the mitigation that you create. So if I if I chose not to count or not to cut 10 of my trees, essentially what we would predict at a broad level is somewhere else someone's going to cut one to nine trees because I didn't cut these 10 trees. So I can't just say, well, I didn't cut 10 trees, that equals this amount of carbon, therefore those are the credits I derive. I have to account for what other people may have done and how that sort of reduces the benefit that I created. Um, heretofore, this has been largely based in a voluntary market context, largely based on this Brian Murray paper from 2004, um, which is a very, it's an early days leakage assessment, right? The, the main conclusions of the paper were it's important, right? It's between 10 and 90%. Um, Oh, and the, the results that they developed may not apply anywhere but the U.S., but we apply them lots of places besides the U.S. Um, so we're essentially trying to fix this. We, we talked about that gap analysis approach. We see a gap here in quality information, and we're trying to fill that with an improvement. It's not maybe the best thing that you could possibly imagine, but it's a step forward. So we're working with some folks at the University of Maine and Ohio State to use the global timber model which is an econometric model. So it, it pulls in that economic uh, component because this is an economic phenomenon, but it also has parameters around land use and forest operations and different types of trees. So it has that biophysical component as well. And what that's helping us predict is, you know, in scenario X versus scenario Y, if we, you know, increase harvest or decrease harvest or put a price on carbon, how does that influence other people's decision-making? Right. How does that decision that I make within my carbon project influence the people outside of the carbon project? 
Uh, what we find at a at a broad level, this is from a, a draft paper. Um, that uh, the preprint is 2023. Um, we find that there's there's four major sources of variability that aren't perfectly predictable, but but pretty reliable. Um, in in different forest types and different regions, there's going to be different leakage factors that apply. If you think about a high intensity system like uh, loblolly pine in Georgia, right? They grow wood like it's grass, right? Really, really fast. And so if you did a carbon project there and took those trees off the market, so we're permanently conserving that, that's going to be a really high leakage factor because that was producing two by fours that were going to go into a house next month. That wood is necessary in the marketplace, right? You compare that to, you know, uh, a tropical hardwood harvest in Costa Rica, like very low harvest intensity. That's by and large, you could call it like luxury wood. It gets sold as decking to Europe and the US. That's not, when you take that off the market, there's not a major immediate need to replace that. And so the leakage factor is less, right? So we find with these different things, the, the time horizon, whether you're thinking about a project over the next 20 years or the next 100 years, the economic equilibrium changes in those different time scales. Um, we've got different, you know, we limited this to IFM, improved forest management, different practices will have different impacts. Am I, am I temporarily conserving this area from harvest or permanently? That creates a different economic signal. Uh, and then the proportion and role. What proportion of the landscape is doing a climate smart forestry intervention as opposed to a typical forestry intervention? As more and more people do climate smart forestry, we could just going to go up and up because there's less wood in the marketplace because we're scaling back some of those activities. Okay. So now, shameless self-promotion. Um, we have the Natural Climate Solutions Resource Center. It's on nature.org. If you Google TNC and NCS, you will find us. Um, all of our research products go up there. Um, and that, that's that's things like a, a you know peer-reviewed article. It's also you know the success story from where we're doing mangrove restoration in Kenya and helping people do sustainable shrimp farming in those mangroves, right? So there's a lot of cool stuff up on there. Um, <clears throat> from the, you know, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that most of the people in this room would consider themselves a nerd. From the nerd perspective, nature base is maybe even a better place to go because this is where our data lives, right? This is we've built over the last four years is naturebase.org. If it doesn't doesn't say that out there, naturebase.org. Um, this is a platform that we've built over the last four years to house and socialize the data that we and our collaborators are creating with the hopes of influencing decision makers, whoever that is. And so what this looks like is it's a um, you know, it's a global atlas. You can zoom in to an, uh, an administrative level two, which is like a county. You can zoom in and, and look at uh, county by county or one kilometer pixels. And you can look at, you guys probably can't quite read, but these are the different um, NCS practices. So increasing soil carbon in croplands, avoided forest conversion, um, you know, protecting peatlands, these different things. You can say, okay, What's the opportunity for climate smart forestry mitigation here versus peatland restoration versus improved agriculture? You can look at what might be better for your part of the world. Okay. If you are a, there's also all these other pieces that you can look at in terms of, you know, we call co benefits, other people might call the primary benefit, right? Biodiversity conservation, ecosystem services, human well being elements that are created by NCS projects. You can look at the, the governmental policies, uh, subsidies or, or penalties that might exist in different jurisdictions, basically trying to provide a one-stop shop for people who want to make decisions about broad scale environmental management, right? And so this is aimed at government agencies and decision makers. It's aimed at IPLCs and community leaders who make decisions for their, their lands. It's aimed at large private landowners. It's aimed at programs like the Family Forest Carbon Program that I talked about, who might want to optimize the places that we're working and who we're working with, right? And so there's a lot of information up on here. My hope is that some of the nerds in the room might want to use that data and it is downloadable and open access.
Um, these are a bunch of papers that I mentioned in the course. Uh, and yeah, that's my name and email. So I'm done. I think I got like 10 minutes for questions, Nancy. Yeah, cool. <laughs> So you mentioned the nature database. Uh, do you guys work with any specific APIs that are open access? Because I saw their website that the data was downloadable, but I don't know if there's like an API available that you guys often use or anything like that. Um, most of that data I know is, is available as like various forms of rasters, and I don't know if it's API limited. Um, I do, so I'm, I'm part of the team that built NatureBase, but I am one of the people who built the data that they house, not one of the people who builds the ar architecture of the website, but I work with her. And if, you, if you'd like to know more about that, like like give me your email and I'll connect you and, and uh, Sam Yo can answer that like that. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, there are a lot of opportunities that uh, we can work together as the Research Institute. Uh, in one of your presentations, you mentioned about the drone data, but uh, I just don't think that's in any drone data exactly in your, any of the projects. So uh, do you have any use case of this drone data for uh, Nature Conservancy you know, in any of the other projects? So the the place where I'm using drone data at the moment, and it isn't something that would be on nature base because not about that, that mitigation potential, but uh, I work with our Indonesia chapter, and they're using... Uh, LIDAR sensors mounted on UAVs for mapping topography to enable better uh, planning of skid trails, right? If you know if you know the topography really well, you can create an efficient skid trail system that minimizes the disturbance. Um, and traditional products, I guess I could call them, DEMs, don't allow that level of resolution. Um, moving forward, uh, there's an opportunity with Nature Base that we, we've heard a lot of people asking for, it's great that you have this global data set, but don't you know that in my corner of the world, there's some local data sets that are, that are better than the global data sets, right? And so we're considering an option where it would be like naturebase.us.org, naturebase.columbia.org, and would have different jurisdictions. And at that point, we'd be much more inclined to pull in drone data and, and pieces that are you can't have a global drone data data set, right? Like, it, or it, it's extremely difficult. So uh, some of those more targeted data would be pulled in in that process, which is that's sort of over the next couple of years instead of the last couple of years. Thank you. Uh, the other thing that I have here is that you mentioned about the Indiana yes, sir. Uh, treatment evaluation quantification, mm -hmm. how that impact or does not impact and uh, I see that in the potential way of, you know, take advantage of the drone technology that you have the primary mission to do. Right. You just have, you know, the data for collected before treatment and after treatment, and you're going to have very well detailed in the comparison. Yeah. You know, at the two level, how much of the growth that you have for mm -hmm. the two days of uh, treatment, et cetera. There's going to be a lot more uh, objective, you know, quantification of mm -hmm. impact. I'm not sure you guys have used, uh, you know, have any plan to use drone data set for those kind of validations. It's it's interesting that you mentioned it on the on the sort of monitoring end of of that Liana cutting work because we've thought about it on the uh, scoping end. Where are there Lianas? Because not every forest has a level of Lianas that warrants cutting for increased mm -hmm. carbon sequestration. But if we could. And our original initial thoughts were like, it's a hyperspectral signal that's the difference in foliage from a liana versus the foliage from a tree. And if we can identify that signal, you know, we could you send the drone out, you map this, you know, 1,000 acres, and you say, yeah, it's these 25 acres that you really need to pay attention to, not the rest of it. That saves a lot of time and money to go and target those treatments well. Um, we did about that much work on that two years ago, hit a brick wall, didn't have funding or people to throw at the brick wall and said, we'll come back to it later. If, if you if you are that person who can break brick walls, I want to talk to you. <laughs> let, let, let me share some data. Okay, let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
I will be not the accuracy of this state of the interface data so that the people who compare with the interface data with some famous public data like the World Bank data mm -hmm. or, or something like that. So, so in terms of accuracy, what we do is we have uncertainty layers associated with every one of our mitigation layers. That is patterned roughly on IPCC's approach to uh, uncertainty. So not, not a number, but a high, medium, low that is informed by backend numbers. Um, the guy I referenced on the geospatial stuff, uh, my, my uh, friend Kurt Fessenmeyer led that work. That is available. It's on nature base um, in the form of the uncertainty layers that pair with each mitigation layer, and then a white paper that explains the details of how we evaluated that and what the calculations were that go behind that. Uh, so that's going to be not in the not in the mapper that I showed. Um, I'm wondering if the mapper has, yeah, top of the screen resources. It'll tell you everything you want and don't want to know about uncertainty. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Thank you.